Hello and welcome to Talking Neoplasmanism, I mean Talking Gnosticism, <laughs> your favorite podcast and video show about Gnosticism related topics and esoterica. We're welcoming back to the show, way over to Dr. Jeffrey S. Kupperman. Hello, Dr. Kupperman. Hey, how you doing? Uh, we're saying that it, it's way too late because a few months back you released a, a fascinating, important, vital book that everybody who's interested in esoterica should go out and buy a copy of because I believe it's Enlightenment or Money Back, right? You do the hours of the book, uh, what, for maybe six months or a year, you reach theosis and that's it, right? Yeah, you're done. You're good. It's just that easy, folks. But before we talk about Dr. Coverman's book, uh, we first have to talk about our Patreon, patreon.com slash Gnostic. For as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can keep the show going. If people don't donate, we have to stop doing the show. This might be the first one you ever watch or listen to. I mean, maybe you'll watch and listen and hate it. But there's a good chance that you're going to love it, especially with tonight's guest. There's a good chance you have watched or listened to the show before. We can't keep doing it without your financial support. You can put a cap on that. So it's a dollar per piece of media per month or more. But you can also say, hey, I only want to pay for two or three pieces of media. I'm on a limited budget. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic. You can also tell people about the show. You can share it on your social media. Like, it doesn't have to be monetary if you want to help us out. Subscribe, like, do all those things that the algor uh, algorithm demiurges and archons need us to do. Um the final thing is, if you sign up for the Patreon, we send you the shows early. You get early access. We usually try to tape in advance. But it, if there's anything else we can do for you, let me know. Or if anybody ever has any ideas about what we could offer on the Patreon. Because we're always trying to build it up. But we don't want to lock content behind a paywall. That's the number one suggestion. But we, we want people to experience stenosis as much as we are able to transmit it, as flawed as we are. Okay, the commercial is over. Dr. Kupperman, a theurgist book of hours. We'll start at the very beginning, the, the, the second word. Uh, what, what is a theurgist? Someone who practices theurgy? I mean, I know that's a perfectly useless answer, um, but it's still what it is, you know. So the question, I guess, then is what is theurgy, um, which is a little more complicated. Uh, the most easy way to think of it is that it is a ritual and ritualized enactment of divine activity. Um, literally means you know, uh, you know theo, theon gods and urgi action. Um, uh, unfortunately, there is no like just single image of what a theurgist might. be. Be, how they might act, what they might do when they're doing theurgy, because theurgy can be anything from high ritual magic where you are attaining the gnosis of the gods uh, to simple prayer at your home altar. They can both be theurgic in nature, depending on what you're trying to do and how you're going about it. Yeah. Is, is there a way that, or a method, or a specific idea of a theurgist and theurgy that you have or you were thinking of when you wrote the book? Or are you trying to kind of deal this, this and bring in all these different meanings and complex uh, uh, ways of understanding? Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, for the most part, uh, the book was meant to be sort of an adjunct or a continuation of living theurgy uh, because theurgy is an activity. It's not just contemplation. It's not theoria. So you should be doing something. And while there are, you know, a slew of exercises in living theurgy, none of them are everyday sorts of activities. They are things more or less designed to move you towards doing uh, the ritual where you come into contact with your personal daimon. But that's not all you should be doing as a theurgist, somebody who's trying to engage in this divine activity. Um, and at least according to Iamblichus in uh, De Mysterious, 
sorry, words are hard. Prayer is the most fundamental aspect of all theurgic activity, that without prayer, even sacrifice uh, lacks efficacy. So a prayer book seemed right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that brings us naturally to our next question, which is, what is a book of hours? And for, there's going to be some people out there who are asking that question, right? What is a book of hours? But some people uh, listening and watching to the show are going to be thinking of Christian prayer when they hear that phrase. But, it, but is there other forms of books of hours, other precedents, other things that you were drawing on? Right. Um, so a book of hours... I guess the short, short version is that some time ago, very wealthy people decided they want to have a monk-like life so they can, you know, get into heaven faster, but didn't actually want to, you know, be monks. Yeah. So they decided on following the sort of a easier version of the, the daily prayer cycle. Um, which is divided into a number of parts of the day. And so that's the basis for the bas basics of a book of hours. It has the prayers for morning, noon, and night uh, for different liturgical seasons uh, and so on. And for the most part, that is what this was uh, based on, which is not to say you know, Christianity has the lock on uh, prayer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, traditionally both uh, Judaism and, and Islam have prayer at specific times of the day. The Judaism certainly has uh, prayer books and you can find uh, beautifully uh, illustrated uh, with beautiful calligraphy um, in both uh, uh, Jewish and, and Muslim prayer books. So there are some sorts of similarities. The, probably one of the, the bigger differences um, is sort of the liturgical calendar that's going on behind uh, a traditional Christian book of hours. Um, and then there are all of the illustrations, because of course, Judaism and Islam are iconoclastic and Christianity not so much. Uh, so you have your uh, illuminations of saints and Christ and Mary and, and so forth. Um, and I threw a little bit of that in too, because that of course also works um, for any sort of polytheistic tradition, which has a plethora of deities and typically has no issue in uh, depicting them in really any way they possibly can. Yeah. Um, you already sort of addressed this at, at, at the opening of the show, but could you go into a little bit more depth about what inspired you to put it together, what it was like to put it together, what the reception's been? Right. Um, so in, one of the first things, and, I, and when I talk to other people who have worked with the diamond, very often the first thing that you are told to do is you need to pray more, yeah. um, which is good advice. Yep. Um, Always good advice case, from anyone. Yes. I mean, it's, it's good advice. Yeah. Um, and within like six months, I became the chaplain of my uh, Masonic lodge. Um, and then about another six months later, I come across uh, these two hefty papers um, on Plethon, who is, was the, uh, the person who got the Greek language manuscripts of Aristotle, Plato, Plotinus, Proclus, maybe not Proclus, Iamblichus, uh, the Hermetica, to the Medici family for eventually Marsilio Ficino to translate. And what Plethon, one of the many things Plethon tried to do was basically do a Renaissance Neoplatonic neo-pagan revival. Yes. Um, and he created this liturgical cycle and these prayers to say at certain times of the day and a fairly complex calendar system. And I thought that was really neat and something should be done with that, especially because Plethon's prayers themselves are god awful. Um, <laughs> so something needed to be done about that too. Yeah. Um, and that, that's sort of where this sort of stemmed from. I spent 
probably the next six months to a year trying to figure out um, from these two papers how to reconstruct uh, the liturgical calendar, uh, which uh, has both uh, a, a 12 or 13 month system when there's the intercalary month, um, as well as uh, moves throughout the lunar cycle. Um, and so you have these two things going on at, at the same time. Then, um, of course, you can say, well, Kupperman, why didn't you just go read Plethon? And then that's largely because both the Catholic and Orthodox Church burnt his book on this. Um, so not a whole lot left, just, just fragments of it. Um, and then I added sort of a, a third layer um, of dividing the year into sort of three seasons or four seasons, really, uh, based on some of Proclus's uh, understanding of how the soul uh, remains with its leader gods, uh, comes out and incarnates in the world, does stuff, and goes back again, sort of this cycle of going back and forth uh, between the divine realm uh, and the, the realm of activity. So I added that third layer. And then I sat down and wrote some 200 odd hymns and prayers, uh, which took a bit. Yes. No, the, the fas fascinating uh, process, fascinating work, fascinating inspirations. I, I, I do really like how you're talking about you know, this connection of the daemon. You, you, you know, we're here on the show, we're talking about, you know, rejected knowledge, secret knowledge, uh, the mysteries of the universe, uh, all these divine beings, divine systems, practices. And then when you really get into it, it's stuff that is hammered into your head in catechism or Sunday school or Hebrew school. <laughs> you know, be nice to people. Uh, pray more. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, it, it needs to turn out to be the secrets of the universe. Uh, yeah, and I know I've heard some occultists complain, you know, I'm going to stop paying attention to, to spirits until they start telling us something new. Like, well, maybe they're not telling us new because we're not bloody well doing it yet. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's They'll tell us something new when we're doing something new, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so, so, so again, you kind of address this a little bit. So you mentioned Plethon, but what what are some of the, the sources that you use, right? I mean, you could, I mean, you kind of didn't use Plethon because his prayer sucked, but like, what are what were some of your other like uh, direct? When we're talking inspirations, the texts, the thinkers, when you're when you're selecting quotes, when you're writing your own hymns and prayers, like who who were you looking to? Who were you reading? Who were you drawing on? Who were you quoting from? Right. Um... A lot of the amplicus, which will come as no surprise to anyone who's seen any of these or, or read my books, um, some Proclus, uh, the Hermetica, uh, the Chaldean Oracles, and of course, like, you know, Plato. Which I've, I've heard of him. Yeah, it seems fitting. Yeah. But, you know. yeah. And so that's where I'm, I'm looking at and would have just these stacks of books and then I would remember a line that's definitely in one of the dialogues, mm -hmm. which is not so helpful when you want to actually find what it says and then cite it. Um, so there was a lot of time me going, oh, yeah, there's that thing. I need to find that. And then writing a big, big footnote in capital letters, look up the citation. Um, and then at the end of the process, spending hours and hours and hours looking up citations, which for most people is not fun or exciting, but I'm kind of weird. Um, and I like living in books like that. So for me, it was great. Uh, but yeah, uh, Plato, Iamblichus, to a small extent, uh, uh, Plotinus, uh, somewhat more Proclus, um, the, Chaldean Oracle, the Chaldean Oracles, the Hermetica, um, uh, occasionally bits of Ficino, because he write, writes beautifully. Um, so if I can use any of his stuff, I'm going to really. Yeah, um, yeah those are, those are pretty much the the, the main sources. So you, you've again kind of touched on this, but we should make it explicit. Uh, why should people pray the hours? I mean, besides that, you should pray more, and this is a really good way to do it. Um, I mean, that is to a certain extent. You know, it's a really 
nice way to get into prayer because it's very structured. You don't have to worry about, okay, what prayer, what should I say? You know, extemporaneous prayer for some of us, I imagine is easy for me, not so much. Um, so having more or less set times a day of when I know I'm going to do my prayers, I know which prayers I'm going to do because it's this phase of the moon and it's this uh, lunar month and it's this um, you know, season, I do this prayer, these sets of prayers, these sets of prayers, and these sets of prayers, and those hymns, and I'm good to go. Uh, so as an introduction to prayer practice, where you want something that's not free form, because maybe you're not used to it yet, a book of hours is, is a, a really good way uh, to, to get at it. Um, it also does get you in alignment with sort of the cycles of uh, the year, the, in the movement of the moon as we exist in the, the sort of the sublunary realm, as we'd say. Um, and part of that will eventually, sort of the long game, um, connect you into uh, some of the more advanced theurgic work called demiurgy, uh, where you are engaging in the creative process with uh, the divine craftsman. Um, so that's part of the future stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I lost my train of thought. No, it, it, it's all good. The, the caboose comes off the track for me all the time, Dr. Kupperman. So, but I, you know, I, I, I think of uh, His Eminence, Sean McCann, the leader of the HAC, right? So I pray the Yonite hours. It, it, he talks about the hours sort of dip divinizing making time sacred and then it's like the time in between the hours becomes more magical and more sacred like it like it's it almost seems like a way of uh consecrating time i, I don't know what you think about that idea but yeah it, uh, I, I you know his eminence is usually quite good with those things i'm gonna have to uh, agree with that um it, it is a way to sacralize your life uh in a not difficult way to do it because there's the prayers aren't just you know things that you're saying they are directed towards a particular goal so uh, plethon said that you, that certain different ones of the months uh, different lunar months um were sort of dedicated to certain things so some might be dedicated to uh, the celestial god some to uh, the chthonic deity some to the daemon some to the ancestors and so you're engaging with those powers uh, on this nice cyclical sort of spiraling uh, movement in and out of sacred time and even when you move out of sacred time into you know your profane life which just profane just means you know ordinary every day you still have those bookends of sacredness that you even sort of bring a little bit of that into, again, as, as, as Eminence said, in between those, those, those very particular sacred hours. Yeah. I'd say for me too, you know, I go back and forth both on the show, in dialogue with people and inside my own head between more psychological metaphorical models of whatever esoterica and mysticism is and then more i don't want to say literal right but uh, models that uh have elements of supernaturalism other beings and what have you but but at the end of the day i i i'd want to i'd, I'd like to give you an argument or or an argument's not the right word, but, but an idea, let me know what you think. That that one of the reasons it doesn't matter is we live in this incredibly materialistic, post-religion, secular age that actually acts quite religious, but doesn't realize it thinks that it's being atheist and having, but actually has religious relationships to all of this other stuff, but that's a different rant. Uh, so we'll just say a very secular society. So we have to do like as much like religious shit as, as excuse my language, a religious crud as possible. And to sacralize, to consecrate our experience. And it's actually really good, you know, the hours is one thing, but also when we talk about the more esoteric, I'm going to put on my wizard robes, right? Like that is a way that makes a hard barrier between, it, it, you do my wizard robes, put on my wizard robes at midnight and do a weird ceremony, but there's nothing more that really separates us out 
from secular living. Um, so, so I'm wondering what you think about that in relation to the hours. If that idea has legs or value for you, uh, or if I'm just you know, on one of my rants. Uh, so, so, just so I'm clear. Um, so the idea that our secular life is still a religious life, is that what you were going for? Oh, no, sorry, that was a separate rant, <laughs> which is our society is particularly secular and materialistic, mm -hmm. that even if there isn't a uh, supernatural, uh, other dimensional, other being aspects to our spiritual work, it's important to do, and it's important to do this kind of regiment of prayer and maybe more weird, ooky, secular stuff, because we're not going to be able to connect to transcendence without getting out of our secular way of thinking. And there's, for me, nothing less secular than the hours, because you're really, you know, in a very theurgical sense, pulling something down, right? In even even if that is just metaphorical. So sorry, that's my actual statement and argument. Without ten other rants that I want to fit in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have this increasingly, at least exterior, exteriorly appearing sacral, sacral, secular world. Words are hard, world. Words are hard. Yeah. Um, I can barely say any of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I only I know think, like 10. <laughs> I think it it pays to get out of that. Um, yeah. I, I would possibly suggest that we need to get out of that. That yes. it it's kind of like doom scrolling on Facebook. You, you get into this very particular material way of thinking and it can drag you down um, I mean, in, in a very spiritual sense. Uh, uh, the, the theorists you know, talk about uh, the, the body of light acquiring this sort of uh, accretions of, of, of hulic matter um, that block uh, the rays of light that come from above that's coming from the gods or from god that's shining down on all of us and we miss out on that we lose some of that and that's the stuff that's calling us home you know um that, that's where we're aiming for at least where our souls are, are aiming for um and so there's this risk i think um of just sliding into a very not so much comfortable as numb uh, materiality, mm -hmm. which I don't think ultimately is particularly good for anyone. Um, you know, and, and I'm not here talking about things like the Enlightenment per se, though I have issues because uh, of you know things like science and medicine. I like you know, not dying at 32. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, there are certainly good things about the material world. Um, but at least for me, if that's all there is, something is lacking. Um, and, so, and as you suggested sort of at the beginning of this, that even if there is no supernatural world, acting as though there were in order to raise ourselves in some way, even if it's only in our own mind, that we, in the end, become happier people, more content people, people who are giving back to our societies more, people who are helping other people become better people. Um, cool. I don't. I don't. I don't see the downside there, really. I, I mean, I guess some people would argue that, uh, you know, there's only so many hours a day, so why would you devote it to, to, to something that's not real? But uh, I think that perhaps, you know, if you, if you are maybe a working class person who's working two or three jobs, then that, uh, that, that has some power, right? But I just think about, you mentioned doom scrolling. For, for many people, many people in the West who are still very busy, we have a little bit of free time and we often waste it. So I, you know, I think that's one of the, the main arguments, perhaps if there isn't, you know, something, some supernaturalism, some dimension that we're touching. Uh, the, the, that, you know, I find the idea of, you know, it's not real, really interesting because 
neither of the stories that are in books or the video yeah. games that I'm playing or the TV shows that I'm watching. Yeah. Um, I don't know what makes one of those things more real than any of the other things. And if those things are worthy of our time, and some of them are and some of them are not, why not this other thing that may or may not, you know, access a real thing, the divine divinities, whatever. But, you know, there are studies that show prayer has a positive effect on people's lives. Yes. In ways that they don't show that, you know, watching television does. So <laughs> given the option. Precisely. Um, what results have you got doing the hours? And, you know, I, I, I don't want to be too prescriptive, but what results should people be looking for? Or, or maybe I'm asking the wrong question. Maybe, maybe you haven't gotten results and you don't want them. And maybe people shouldn't be looking for results. I don't know. But what, what would you say about like, hey, the, the science of doing the hours, the science of buying your book and wanting to get something out of it. Like if people are journaling, monitoring, uh, praying from this book, should something be happening? What should it be? What have you experienced? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think you should be expecting you know, lights descending from the sky. Uh, one of Yamlika's is, is students claimed that when he prayed, he turned into gold and levitated. Uh, you know, if light shining down upon him. And of course, his response was, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> those are not the things that you really should be looking for. You know, prayer is ultimately, I think, a, a humble and humbling activity uh, because you are putting yourself forward um, and under the care or guidance of something higher than you which means admitting that there's something beyond just you and your ego, which in and of itself, I think, is a you know, glorious thing to do uh, every now and then. Um, so if you know, get nothing besides getting out of your, your own head uh, into to something larger, uh, I think you've done something that's, in fact, tremendously good. There isn't any particular thing that you should necessarily be aiming for or, or ne are necessarily going to experience because everybody's in a different place uh, in their spiritual life, in their prayer life. Uh, so your experience of prayer is always going to be somewhat different for, from other people's. I want to say that said, here's something that everyone's going to experience, but I don't know that there really is that sort of thing. Uh, generically, prayer is uh, a purificatory act. When a theurgic prayer purifies uh, the soul to a certain extent, illuminates the soul, a certain extent helps to perfect the soul. It is one piece of theurgic activity that can be done by itself, which is why something like a book of hours, I think, is very helpful because it is just that one thing that is less daunting than here is a two hour ritual uh, where you need your magic robes and your special incense and your chanting these weird barbaric names that make no sense to you. It, 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 it can be off-putting, it can be intimidating, you know, pick one or both. Uh, prayer, is, prayer is not easy, but it's easier yeah. than that sort of thing, especially, again, if, if you're starting, uh, if, if this is a new practice. And prayer was never really part of my practice before. And I was raised uh, in ref very, very reformed, reformed Judaism, <laughs> um, you know, High, the high holy days and they made us go to Sunday school and made us what well, you know is the operative word which I suppose is somewhat ironic given that I now study religion for a living um, so you know prayer wasn't my thing it's still not really my thing uh, it, it's not something that I 
enjoy. It is something that I do. I have a regular prayer practice. Um, and it does help me get out of my head. It does help me to connect to things that I feel are bigger than me and that has a real effect uh, on me, both in the secular world and in the spiritual world. I don't know if that actually answers your question, but I think it kind of does. <laughs> I, I think it definitely kind of does. Well, I think it answers it as much as it can be answered. So, which is often what happens on this show. <laughs> um, okay, so is the book only for those in, in your or another Neoplatonic group? I don't know of any other Neoplatonic groups, but let's hypothetically say they exist. Um, it, is it is it compatible with other mystical belief systems, or is it just yeah. hey, I'm I'm a Neoplatonist? No, it, it it is. That was the 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 point was to make as something as universal as something like this can be universal. Is it going to appeal to everyone? Clearly no. But are we you know, specifically calling on Apollo and Hermes? No, we're not doing that either. Uh, I use a lot of uh, titles that are relevant to the divinity or divinities um, that are you know associated with the lunar months uh, for 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 instance which you know are originally based on uh, a greek pagan model because that's where this is all coming out of um but you know uh Iamblichus is very much into the the interpretatio greca the greek version of the the roman thing right that you know that there are so many gods and that they appear to us differently uh, depending on, on the culture that, that we are in, which I know uh, is a hard no for if you're a hard polytheist. Um, yeah. If you are not a hard polytheist, and even if you are, you can still engage in, in these prayers because it doesn't, again, it doesn't explicitly you know, say, okay, and now we're praying to Mary. Um, that's not going on. You can decide based on the theme of the lunar cycle that you're on or the, the lunar month that you're in. Do you want this to be dedicated to a particular god or goddess? Is that part of your religious practice? Cool. Go do that. Uh, are you... I don't want to say more open and free because that makes it sound like you're a hippie and I'm really not going there. Um, do you have a, you know, a, a soft polytheistic perspective? Cool. Are you a practicing Catholic that has a mystical bent? Well, saints are a thing. Cool. Uh, you know, most religions have this sort of panoply of beings that get prayed to. Um, it's not necessarily just God or the gods. And the book is designed with that sort of ideology in mind that you can personalize your prayer. Very cool. Well, I, I think this brings us into to wrap up time. You know, we didn't talk about the ENT, and I know there's other shows about it, but if you could just tell people a little bit about the ENT and then do do the commercial for you, tell people where to find you, where they can find the book and, and all that good stuff. So, right, so the ENT is the, the Ecclesia Neoplatonismus Theurgia. It is, as far as I know, the only Neoplatonic religious body uh, largely information as it has been for the last i don't know how long um uh, you can find us we have a website which is uh, theorgia.org uh, we are on facebook because it's the 21st century um, we're currently doing a monthly uh, online meeting where we're talking about uh, our statement of principles which may or may not be heavily indebted to the hac seems uh, very familiar it, 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 it is, uh, you might notice a correlation. And in this case, there is also causation involved. Um, uh, so we're doing that every month. Uh, so that's been pretty good. Uh, 
So that's sort of where you can find us, uh, uh, find the ENT. Um, you can find the book uh, most likely on Amazon, but you can also go directly from the publisher, which is Avalonia Books. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Coverman, thanks so much for joining us. And everybody, go out and buy the book. Yes, yes. And thanks for having me. Thank you.